Uthran Korja, when I was asked to speak of trauma and of heeding and healing the wounds of war, I was extremely grateful. Very, very happy that this topic was suggested to me. For reasons that will become apparent uh, during my uh, address, but principally because I am not convinced that the danger of war, of conflict, of violent conflict on this island is over. I think we can look to the lessons of previous centuries when we had long periods of what appeared to be peace, but which were suddenly and violently interrupted and took us in dramatic directions and into ultimately the period of the War of Independence and then the Civil War. My words today are the consequence of witness. They come from what I've seen and what I've heard. The long conversations with the survivors of violence, but also with perpetrators. Traumatic memory isn't confined just to those on whom violence was inflicted. I spent much of my life away at the wars, most frequently civil wars, the scenes of genocide, ethnic cleansing, man-made starvation. I've gone into the noise and fury of battle and afterwards into the anguished and often complex silences. I've tried to explore the essential fictions that men and women construct to protect their minds from the consequences of the violence they have suffered or which they have inflicted. And I've come sadly to the conclusion that there's nothing no cruelty, no indignity, that we as human beings are not capable of inflicting on each other. But I'm also convinced, and convinced by examples on this island of ours, that humanity pushed into extremists is also capable of immense generosity, of that which might help bind wounds and lay foundations that help us to move away from the possibility, and that's all I say that it is, possibility, of a return to violence. To heal the wounds of war, we must heed the pain of others. And we must do it especially when they belong to what are described in divided societies, people who belong to the other side. We must above all look on the atrocities of the past, whoever carried them out with clear eyes, to heed is to see things as they actually were. The body parts shoveled from the ground after the IRA bombs on Bloody Friday. The mutilated remains of the victims of the loyalist Shankill butchers found in Belfast alleyways. The dying man bleeding out from a paratrooper's bullet on Bloody Sunday. To heal, having heeded, is to acknowledge and be respectful towards the pain of others as well as our own. As a consequence, I'm impatient with keyboard warriors, barroom balladeers, and the manipulative liars of social media. And I fear the ease, the growing ease, with which people can construct narratives that deny the true nature of killing. What am I qualified to talk to you about? I'm not an academic historian, but I can tell you about killing. I can tell you about the question that has vexed me all of my adult life, is why do we kill? What does it do to us? And how do we recover from it? So it's a personal reflection today. I don't speak on behalf of anyone. And my experience of reporting on atrocity has taught me not to believe that anything I can say will make much, if any, difference to the course of violent events. I vividly remember coming out of Rwanda after the genocide and producing the first documentary on that horrific slaughter, 800,000 people murdered in 100 days, and broadcasting it and somehow thinking that the public would be gripped by what we were revealing, the worst genocide since the Nazis. And it was met with indifference. I don't blame people for that. That is, to use the, uh, the phrase I've heard often in our line of work, it is how it is. 
And I'm conscious, too, of what attaches to that, a sense of what is now called moral injury. In my own case, a fear that held me paralysed in Rwanda in 1994, the wish to intervene but to be too terrified for one's own safety to take that risk. I can speak to you now at some distance in time from the wars I have witnessed. Yet they live with me in everyday trauma, in vivid detail. I think of Brian Friel's great line from translations, to remember everything is a form of madness. So I don't write or report or speak because I think I can draw people back from the brink or remotely Imagine that the words of a reporter will pierce the mental armour of those who have spent years, decades, rationalising to themselves the necessity of killing. I'm here because I believe that witness has rights of its own. That what I report can join with the voices of others who try to stand outside the clamour of conflict and offer true stories that might, just might, become part of a larger institutional memory, something that can sit alongside the work, support, augment, inform the work of the professional historians. And I'm here because of the President's generous invitation, because I believe this series of conversations, while rooted in the past, can inspire a dialogue about the present, which has as its hallmarks generosity, compassion, and above all, honesty. And these values, heeded in the heart and mind, might shape an Ireland in which we can talk of healing. Now, I shouldn't have needed a psychiatrist to tell me that family history and the history of this island where I grew up were part of what sent me to explore the trauma of others. But when he did, I was immensely relieved. There was no medication for it, he said, but this is what's wrong with you. Because until then, I'd wondered whether my relentless returning to the scenes of violence was not in some way perverse, or as one well-meaning older relative asked me once, what do you want going into all that old stuff for? It's a good question for today. The reason I go into the old stuff, and whether that's the stuff of the 1920s or of the 1970s or 80s, is because I cannot shed its influence. It's there in the memory of the stories I heard growing up and the troubles I myself reported. And it's central to the shaping of this island now. Now, I was not the first member of my family to experience the terror of war. My grandmother, Hannah Purtle, was 15 when the Irish Revolution began. By the time the fighting stopped, seven years later, I believe she'd been changed by what she'd witnessed and participated in on country lanes and on the streets of Listowel. War in North Kerry was the broken corpses of comrades after torture, the blood of a policeman congealing in a gutter, the revolver pointed towards her head in a threat of execution, and night after night waiting for a battering on the door. As a member of Common Amon, my grandmother spied and smuggled messages and weapons. Heading into the winter of 1920-21, an atmosphere of terror envelops North Kerry. The guerrillas attack a police patrol. A village is raided and burned in retaliation. Prisoners are tied to the front of lorries as human shields to forestall ambush. Others are dragged behind vehicles along country roads. One near Tralee is tied to a horse and dragged across the countryside. Savage beatings are routine. Many in the ranks of the newly arrived black and tans and the auxiliaries are men already brutalised by years of horror on the Western Front. And here's a family story. Growing up, I heard of a man called Darcy, who my father assured me was a classic black and tan, the sweepings of an English jail. Darcy gave a death threat uh, to my grandmother, physically pointed his weapon at her, and then went to her employer and said she would be killed if she didn't leave Listowel. And so there he sat, this brutal Englishman who had tried to kill my grandmother. But with the help of Professor Linda Connolly, who's here today, 
I was able to track the real Darcy. And who was Darcy? He was a teenage boy from Donegal who signed up with the British Army, who was then, even though he was underage, 16 I believe, he was then put into what they call one of the special brigades. And these were the people responsible for firing gas and flamethrowers at the Germans. And so he was in the heart of the horror of the Western Front. When after the Somme they decided to return the so-called teenage Tommies and send them back, Darcy was demobilised. He was too young and was sent back. And then war started in Ireland, and this traumatised young man found a new home for his neurosis, and that was on the streets of North Kerry. And so he became a man hated locally, so hated that my grandmother was put on a, an assassination detail to track him. But his true story was that of a, a poor Catholic from Donegal who'd found the only work he could and been traumatised by it. And in that I see the, to Larkin's phrase, the way man hands on misery to man and how trauma enveloped Darcy, and but also my grandmother, who for years afterwards suffered depression. Part of it, at least, the consequence of her experiences. Enlist old people were fingered by IRA intelligence as spies, abducted and shot dead, their bodies left on the roadside, with signs proclaiming, spies beware of the IRA. The IRA shoots District Inspector Tobias O'Sullivan of the RIC, he is a father of three young children. He lives a few minutes up the street from the Keane family home on Church Street, where my grandmother would go to visit her future in-laws. His wife, May, sees the blood flowing from his ruined head. She dies soon after he does, broken by grief. O'Sullivan's movements to and from the police barracks on Church Street have been tracked by spies, as one of his assassins remarks, we had been informed of his regular movements by a number of scouts in Lestole who put us on his trail as soon as the order was received. It was as simple and irrevocable as that. Four local IRA men walking along the road outside Lestole are picked up by the tans, badly beaten and then lined up before a firing squad and shot. Despite being wounded, one runs for his life and survives to tell the tale. My grandmother, Hannah, is among the group of women detailed with making sure the dead are given a decent burial in accordance with the rites of the church and the customs of the country. One common among member who sees the arrival of the bodies at Tralee Barracks recalls that the face of one, a fine young fellow whom I knew personally, was all smashed in. The women tending the bodies are verbally abused and some are beaten. They find the dead dumped in a shed used by the police for storing turf. They wash and clean them. Now, how easy is it to write that? They wash and clean them. And then you imagine these country women painstakingly cleaning away the blood and gore and how that imprints on the mind and the spirit. When a retired local policeman, James Kane, is killed by the IRA as a suspected informer, his family is boycotted. They are refused service in shops and forced to walk long distances because nobody will give them a lift. They live among people who wish to erase their presence as the life of their father had been erased. In the British National Archives, I read the letters of Cain's traumatised children and see the hatred that engulfed some in our town. His daughter Elizabeth was like my grandmother, a draper's assistant in Listole. But after his murder, the staff refused to work with her, despite, as the employer says, her having been an employee for 15 years. She couldn't find another job. Elizabeth herself wrote, After our father's death, people whom we looked on as our friends turned their back on us. And at one particular social entertainment, the first I attended in the town after his death, I was the only girl ignored. A younger sister had a nervous breakdown and became, in Elizabeth's word, a complete wreck. The adult ch 
children became destitute and were evicted from their home in Listowel. Eventually, they scattered, vanished. They were erased from the story of the town. When Elizabeth's lawyers wrote to a local solicitor to try and gather information in support of her claim for compensation, they were told, and I quote, there is a great reluctance to admit to having taken part in a boycott of this kind or on the part of anybody to give evidence against their neighbours. All parties in Ireland are anxious to forget the troubles of the years 1921-22 and banish them as a hideous nightmare. But in the minds of the traumatised, there is no banishing, not then, not now. Down the generations it goes. And I think of Tobias O'Sullivan, whose killing was one of the most infamous in the Revolutionary War in Kerry. When I asked a relative of his why their experience of war had not been written into the national narrative, I was told, and these are some of the most poignant words I've ever heard, in war. She replied, because nobody ever asked. Last year, I sat with the son of Jack O'Hearn, one of Tobias' assassins, and when I asked about his father, Sean O'Hearn's eyes fill with tears. He struggles to accept that his kind, warm-hearted, hard-working father could have killed in cold blood. He said to me, I mean, how could you live with that? to walk up behind a man and shoot him in the back of the head in front of his wife and child. And there it was, trauma breathing, the 75-year-old son of a long dead gunman carrying the trauma of what his father had done a hundred years before. In my grandmother's house, Tobias O'Sullivan became a ghost story told by my father, a green figure, nameless, who stalked the house after dark. Trauma present yet unreal, mediated through storytelling. I was told that he was a dead British soldier, not an Irishman, the truth. I was told he would wander forever. I was told not that he was gunned down by men who were comrades and arms and friends of my people. This just wasn't told, could not be told at that time. There was too much to my child's inquiring mind that was unknown. My early knowledge of the revolutionary period was shaped by my father's storytellers. He was a great storyteller. And by what I heard in that Listowel kitchen, he was also one of life's romantics. When he was picked to play the role of a hero of the 1798 rebellion in the RTE film When Do You Die, Friend, his performance won a Jacobs Award. That was in 1966, 50 years after the revolution and three years before the war erupted in the north and our commemorations could never be so simple again. Never so simple, so lacking in nuance, so embedded in the narratives of origin constructed in the exhausted aftermath of the civil war. For those who were the families of the dead of our revolution, on all sides. There was no healing space because the War of Independence gave way to the Civil War. And that, in turn, led to the horrifying realisation of the savagery we were capable of inflicting on each other without any help from the British, even if they did supply the guns that launched the Civil War at the Four Courts. Our remembering, therefore, was not an exchange between survivors and descendants, an openness, Although in fairness, I can think of very few countries in the wake of conflict where that has been the case. We need to look at nations as they struggle or don't struggle with their legacies of empire from Britain to France to realise just how widespread is this condition of, of a kind of qualified amnesia or of a creation of histories that allow us to live with the horrors of the past. It wasn't until years later when I found myself at the scene of shootings, bombings, assassinations, funerals, that the real meaning of violence, the human dimension in all its blood, its body parts, its tears, its empty stares, came home to me. 
there in Belfast, Lurgan, Derry and in small towns and villages, and again in Rwanda, Iraq, Algeria, Lebanon, Colombia, Congo and so many more. My, and it is a word I don't like using, but I do use it in relation to this, my hatred of war hardened, my loathing of militarism. But I also saw in South Africa and in smaller localised initiatives in the Balkans and the Middle East attempts to heal through the processes of truth-telling. I'm a firm believer in the power of communities addressing what Seamus Heaney called the tragedy of neighbourly murder through mediated exchanges, through the respect shown by listening. I'm particularly concerned today with the role of leaders. My experience has convinced me that for leaders to confront the trauma of the past, they must speak with generosity, particularly those on whatever side, and I stress whatever side, who represent those who bear responsibility for past violence. The greatest, most transformative leadership involves humility. It means setting to side, one side justifications, blaming, politicking, what a boutery. It means speaking directly to the pain of those who still live with the trauma of the murdered father, brother, sister, son and daughter. Acknowledge the pain caused. See it from the side of those still struggling with the legacy of violence. It means we must pay full attention to the potential for pain caused by words, gestures, slogans, chants. This is a universal responsibility for political leaders, as is the imperative of creating mechanisms that honestly address the actions of all those, out of uniform or in uniform, who took part in violence. We cannot have a partitioning of concern for victims according to our partisan loyalties. On this island, leaders need to heed the pain of families of Bloody Sunday, Bloody Friday, Warrington, Lochan Island, Enniskillen, and so many more places. We can then talk about learning from the lessons of the past. Or to paraphrase the words of Van Morrison, believe that the healing has begun. Thank you. <laughs>